Tenzies. Tenzies. Tenzi. That is a pretty fun game, actually. It is fun. Yeah. I like it because it forces the kids to do some math on the fly. Mm. And I like to play it with them where we're not just trying to match one dice, but mm-hmm. it might be like, hey, make sets of seven or eight. And so right. they got to do the they combinations. Com- combining and, things. Yeah. I think that's just I like fun. it because there's just like a ton of ways to play. Oh. So it's never the same. Yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Fits my personality. Yeah. So for now... <laughs> we got a podcast to do. Podcast. So, welcome to the Furlough Capital Real Estate Podcast, where we dive into the intricacies of passive real estate investing. And our mission is to equip people to invest wisely, both in properties and in people, so that together we can build our wealth while improving housing. My name is James, and this is my wife, Jessie. Hey. Hey. Still here. Still here. Still good. <laughs> and so this is episode 10. Yeah, we made it. Super exciting. And so as we kind of like, we got the ramp up to it last episode, we're mm. doing it this one. These are what I'm calling my top 10 hacks. Top 10 hacks. Yeah, which is probably most helpful if you are uh, an active investor and especially managing your own units. These You'll find these mm. especially helpful. If you're a passive investor, this will be your like, oh yeah, I don't want to invest in real estate. I want someone else to do it for me. <laughs> that's that's my secret hope that you go, oh yes, James has figured this out. Let's let him do it. But that's so helpful, um, you know, yeah. to for them to know, oh, this is what that person is taking care of and doing and Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so last episode they were kind of like high level kind of concepts. These are gonna be a little bit more like mm. highly practical, highly tactical, almost minuscule. Okay. Nitty gritty. Yeah. And you're going to notice that in the very first one. Very first one. <laughs> don't waste your time with yard signs. In the age of the internet, you don't need to. <laughs> Plus, they know nothing. This is probably the most annoying part to me. They know nothing. And so you have to verbally yeah. tell them your ad. Every single time oh, yeah. they call. Because the very first time we had a yard sign, put it out because like, that's what you do. Sure. And I could always tell who it was because they'd be like, so it's for rent. What is it? Uh... I'm like... All right, well, it's a three bedroom, one bath, <laughs> with a large fenced in backyard and a two car garage, laundry hookups. We're asking, you know, whatever it was, yeah. um, with this such a deposit, pets allowed, no smoking. Like, I was just, I was regurgitating the yeah. ad and I got super annoyed by it. And so I was like, this is dumb, never doing it again. <laughs> and so we got rid of that sign and just posted <laughs> online. And I also looked at it as a form of screening. Where yeah. I'm like, you know what? I only want to run to people who have internet access because I want yeah. them to pay online anyways. Well, that was the other thing that we experienced is like with the yard sign, there would be just random people who would walk by. Yeah. And they wouldn't know anything either. And so it was like, okay, you're not even pre-screening yourself at all. Yeah. Maybe today, like I put out a yard sign with a QR code that then went okay. to the listing. Sure. That could make sense. Maybe. But just don't do it. It's a waste of time. Yeah. People find it. All right. Number two. Landlordlocks.com is awesome <laughs> because it lets you use a master key system where switching up locks is crazy easy. And I also don't carry around a bunch of extra doorknobs or keys or mm-hmm. locks with me. I just have the one yeah. and it's super nice. And there's like this control key where you can just kind of punch it in, rotate a little bit and you can pull out the core of it. So the knob stays, but the actual lock part comes out and then you can easily swap out another one. It's super easy. They're a little bit more expensive. Okay. They're a lot more expensive than just grabbing <laughs> a random quick quickie set sure. at uh, Home Depot, but man, they're so easy to turn and yeah. change. Well, and once you hit that scale of however many properties, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, this is yeah. actually worth it and probably saving you a ton of time. Yeah. Which I would put that scale at like more than two. <laughs> <laughs> It's really nice. <laughs> For you. <laughs> it's like, really, really yeah, nice. Totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. That's so that's probably one of my like, dude, just do yeah, it. It's funny. Like I I have one key and that's what I carry around. Like see, gets me in everywhere. I, okay. I can see, see why that, that would be like or something. No, no. Oh. I, I could see why you would really love that as a hack. For me, it may not be as important because I have like twelve keys uh, on my key ring. That's horrible. <laughs> like keychains and all the things. So yeah, um, I I don't know. Like as a landlord, isn't that just like a like a in your head something you envision is like a big old key ring? No. You're like no, 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 dude. If I could figure out a way to get rid of keys <laughs> altogether, I would. <laughs> you could. You could have like no, code signing. Still got to have the keys. I actually looked into this to see if landlord box had a like a keypad thing oh. and they actually do yeah and that one is like crazy expensive <laughs> not worth it yet. so i bought one that i put on the main door at the okay. apartment okay, building okay. yeah so people could have that mostly because 
So they don't have to have two keys. Well, they didn't have to have two keys no matter what, because it was what they call a mezzanine lock. So their key got them in. That's cool. Every key worked on that front door, every key within that building. And then their own key worked only on their own unit. But the problem is for packages and or friends. Oh, that's right. And so I've eventually had enough tenants ask me, and I actually did like a survey. I was like, hey, this will like reduce security significantly if I do this. Do you want me to? And everyone was like, yes, please. Oh, all right. Interesting. Okay. Cool. There you go. (laughs) Convenience over over privacy and security. I'm in. I don't care. So I mean, that's what we did. Yeah. Uh, number three, pre-record your onboarding speech and send that to new tenants. Mm-hmm. So instead of talking to them for like an hour, or half hour, whatever, while they're signing, when they're actually thinking about moving in, they can watch it ahead of time. And then you could also have them e-sign the lease ahead of time. Mm-hmm. I, I think you remember this when we first got started. Yeah. Like it was, okay, we're going to talk to you about all the things mm-hmm. and all the rules. And like, and it was like... And we would use the lease agreement as kind of the, uh, the, I don't know what you call it, like almost like an outline for the talking yeah. points. And we would go through it and then we would sign each page yeah. and we were doing it that way. And when we first got started, we were signing everything by hand and we had a scanner and we were like <laughs> scanning them that on was, like, the spot. Little, yeah, Actually, I think the first time they scanner. had carbon copies uh-huh. and we were like tearing those off, handing them to them. Then we would scan them at home and then we started scanning them on the spot and we would yeah. email it to them. And then I had an iPad and then I got an Apple pencil mm-hmm. and we were signing it digitally but I was still giving the speech, and yeah. it was still just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and you could just tell. I don't know, yeah. twenty. Their eyes their would glaze. Eyes. Oh, they're like, <laughs> and glaze over. This is so this is much. So boring. <laughs> yeah, and so by switching to where like I created just a quick, easy PowerPoint, and I recorded it, and the very first time I did it was just I just recorded my voice and walked through it. I'm now a little more advanced, where I actually have myself and it's picture in picture, and mm-hmm. it's still PowerPoint, so it looks cooler. But like, yeah. just create a PowerPoint, record yourself reading through the stuff. And then put it on YouTube, unlist it, and mm-hmm. just send it to them. Mm-hmm. Ours is a little more advanced. Now we've got it where it's actually like an online class, and yeah. we can ask them questions and make sure that they went through it, whatever. If you're not worried about that, you just have an additional document that says, I watched it, and they sign it, whatever. Sure. And you know, if you're really worried about them, actually have done it. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's something that I like. That has yeah, saved me a ton of time. Yeah. I think it's just a better experience overall for people. For sure. And then they can go through the sign and just like do the massive clicks because you've already gone through it all. Yeah. And one of my videos is actually like walking through the rental agreement mm. and saying, okay, it says this here, it says this here. Yeah. So anyways, pre-record your stuff, put it Perfect. online, let them watch it. That's number three. Number four, <laughs> um, when I have to work really hard to put a deal together, it's usually not a good deal. And that's mostly because they're not motivated enough to meet my strict criteria. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this over and over where we've tried to get stuff. I remember the mm-hmm. very first storage facility we tried to get. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, and it was like, man, we worked. Yeah, we were just working it and trying to look at it different ways. Like and weeks and Had a weeks bunch of conversations. Of yeah, yeah. And it was just like. And it seemed like we had a deal and then it fell through at the last yeah. minute. And it was just like, ah. Yeah. Uh, that, ele- that other 11 unit place oh, in Albany. Yeah. Yep. It was that same thing where it just was like. Yeah. It was just so much work. I ended up mm-hmm. driving to Portland, spent a day doing mm-hmm. negotiations, mm-hmm. and it was like this high pressure situation, like, oh, just so much. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I've just, my observation has been the ones that just come together easy is because they're motivated or the value is right. there. It's just super obvious it for matches. everybody, and it just works. Yeah. I think about uh, the 15 unit place that we bought. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, technically there was a couple months in between it, mm-hmm. but it was like, I made an offer, they rejected it. They came back to me later. I made another offer. They accected it. Like, yeah, it's it was easy. straightforward. Yeah, and so that's just been my experience. Is mm-hmm. if I have to work really hard to make it work, it probably, probably doesn't doesn't actually work. work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so makes you a little nervous about um, one I'm looking at right now because <laughs> I'm having to work a little harder <laughs> to get it. So I'm like, all right, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I can't help it. I'm gonna keep trying. <laughs> I think it's worth it. All right, number five. And this is by far going to be your favorite rule. I already know it. And there's um, five sub bullets to oh, go my with word. this one. I know. So I know. really, you came up with twenty five. No, 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 no. Oh, no. They there's, just go it's with all, it. It all kind of. I just had to break it out. All right, you ready for this? Use love and logic principles with tenants. It's true. Am I right? I already know you're gonna love it. So, if you're not That's familiar, smart. if you're not familiar with Love and Logic, it's actually a parenting class <laughs> technique. Um, but I find that it works with tenants. By the way, it also works with spouses, coworkers, all yeah. sorts of stuff. If you get a chance to take a Love and Logic class, even if you don't have kids, yeah. totally worth it. So here are some of the main mm-hmm. rules that I've kind of I've made them work for tenants. That I makes guess. sense. Sure. So first one is you want to set 
firm, enforceable limits mm -hmm. without anger, lectures, or threats. So an example of a, an enforceable limit means something that I have control over, something mm -hmm. that I can do. And so it might, you might say something like, we only rent the tenants who pay the rent on time and in full, mm -hmm. which by the way is something I tell them. Yeah. And I actually, I'm straight up, I tell them we only rent to responsible tenants. And mm -hmm. I define those as people who pay the rent on time and in full and who communicate appropriately with myself and with others. Mm -hmm. And then third, they take care of the property as if it's their own. Yeah. Like you do all three of those things, I will let you live there as long as you want. Yeah. But that's the only people who we rent to. And so, which I can enforce, mm. I get to evaluate that kind of stuff. So yeah. set, firm, and firm means you don't give. Yeah. Whatever limit you set, stick That's with it. That's what it is. So yeah. pick a Uphold reasonable it. one, stick one that you know you can enforce, mm. that you can take care of. All right, number two, and this has four sub points to it. Are you I kidding? I gotta explain it, <laughs> I gotta explain it. Um, it's one of, this is part of that five, don't worry. Um, when a tenant causes a problem, Hand it back to them empathetically, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. So again, use empathy. So you might say, oh, that's a bummer that you don't have the rent. <laughs> like, oh, that's a shame. Like oh, you, yeah. like, yeah. and the way I've tried to uh, think about it in my head is they're breaking the system that you've created. Mm -hmm. Like that's what they have the problem with. It's with the system. Mm. It's with furlough family homes, furlough capital, mm. whatever we call ourselves. To our tenants, we're called furlough family homes. Yeah. And like, that's the thing that they've broken. I just go, ah, oh, man, that's a shame that you're not able to pay your rent to the company. Like it's not, I, I you act don't like make it's it personal. Me. Yeah, yeah, sure. exactly. And you just have empathy. Ah, oh, man. Yeah. You know what? We, unfortunately, we only rent to tenants who pay their own time and that's not you. Mm -hmm. So start off with some empathy, just like really like, ah, oh, that's a shame. Do not get angry at them. Don't mm -hmm. yell at them. Don't send me text messages saying, pay me your money. That kind of thing. <laughs> uh, number two, and again, you want to use an enforceable statement. Okay, you want to remind them of them. Unfortunately, we'll have to deliver the non-payment paperwork tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Again, that's something. So the unfortunately there, right? There's some more empathy. Ah, man, this is a shame. But we have to do this. We're going to deliver. It's, I'm explicitly telling them something that I can do, which is deliver the non-payment paperwork. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling them, man, unfortunately, you have to pay your rent tomorrow. Yeah. No, they don't. I can't make them do that, but I can deliver the paperwork. Yeah. Number three, share some ideas to give them ownership. So you could ask them, hey, do you want to hear what some other tenants have done? And maybe they say yes. Mm. And you go, yeah, well, first, like maybe they moved in with a friend. Mm. What do you think of that? Or, well, they asked their family for some mm. money. What do you think of that? Or they call, I wrote CSC, which is one of our local charities yeah. here. And, and then you would say, what do you think of that idea? And they go, mm. ah, I just don't know. And then she go, all right, well, I know you'll come up with something reasonable. Mm. And then you're done. You go, let me know what you think. And yeah. so uh, it's the, you're just helping them get out of the fight or flight mm. mindset and into problem solving by giving them some potential ideas to work with. Yeah. But you want to- But wanna, not solving it for them. Yeah, you want to give them permission. You want to yeah. give them some ideas and then ultimately hand it back to them. Go, you got this, which mm. is like a classic love and logic mm -hmm. principle that we do with kids. And it works really good here. And then, um, and then finally, uh, and I think this is just kind of, this is kind of important. You don't need to have an answer right away. Hmm. It is totally okay to say, well, let me think about it and get back to you tomorrow or next week or whatever yeah. it is. I think that's something where I felt pressure hmm. initially to like always have an answer, always have a response. Yeah. If a tenant came to me and said, hey man, I'm not gonna be able to pay my rent. Can you take a partial payment? Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I gotta have an answer for this. And obviously over time we built systems. Yeah. So now I, I do have answers to that kind of stuff. But when right. we first got started, I would get hit with something where yeah, I'm like, like oh, oh, I don't know. Actually, I'd be like, man, I don't know the answer to that. And, and I learned to go like, let me think about that mm. and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And most, like not most, every single time they're like, yeah, yeah, cool. Like they appreciated, like yeah. I wasn't just a gut. It wasn't just a straight up no. Yeah. And you know, sometimes it was a no. Oftentimes I come back with some sort of other proposal, yeah. something like that. So just a, so that was a lot. Actually so, my favorite love and logic principle. Boom, <laughs> I like that. Uh, so it's, so the idea again, number five is to use love and logic. Yeah. And that's don't get angry, don't get crazy. Mm -hmm. Just what you have control over is yourself. And so only make statements that you can control. Mm -hmm. So you start with those types of enforceable limits and you're just straight up front, be very upfront about them. Yeah. Don't try to make them a surprise, Yeah. which is the whole point of the onboarding process and recording the video. That's why and we it, do all that. And it kind of goes back to the last week. Like if you zoom out to that bigger picture, it's yeah. like communicate and be respectful. Yeah. Like it boils down to that. Mm. These are some different ways to do that. But yeah, awesome. that's what it's. That's it. That's what yeah. it's based on. And so again, like, so when they cause a problem because yeah. they're not paying the rent, they cause damage, whatever, yeah. they're disturbing another tenant. 
You start out with empathy. Mm. That's really important. You don't lose your cool. You use enforceable statements. Tell mm. them what you are going to do, what you have control over. Give them some ideas, and that gives them ownership. You let them solve it. And then just remember, you don't have to have the answer right away. Mm. You can always say, I'll come back to it yeah. when they cause a problem. Ooh, I, that is great. <laughs> Boom. It's good. Love and logic with tenants. There you go. That's number five. We're halfway there. Number six. <laughs> you might appreciate this one too. If you're married, which we are, only invest in places where you are both on board. Mm. And as a corollary, this might require presenting it visually to your spouse. And you can push a little bit, but don't push too hard. <laughs> and and I just think, uh, I think you can run. hack? Oh, yeah, totally. Huh. That's how I think about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think... Uh, oftentimes like guys will get ourselves into trouble because I like I'll get myself I'll say it this way I will get myself into trouble with you because I will look at a property I'll look at all the pictures mm. I'll look at the listing I'll then throw the numbers into my underwriting spreadsheet and I'll spend a ton, ton of time looking at it yeah and then I'll come to you and go hey I think I found a great deal let me tell you about it and you have to verbally process mm. very quickly what I just spent 15 30 minutes looking at taking in and just kind of soaking in mm-hmm. in like two to three minutes i was like yeah here you go you're welcome what and you're like uh okay i don't know like it's just super hard for you to process yeah and so what i found that works here's the hack yeah is (laughs) to to slow it down and go Mm -hmm. let me show you to you Mm -hmm. in some cases a lot of cases it's taking you to the spreadsheet it's actually walking you through Mm -hmm. letting you see the pictures letting you look at the google map kind of Mm -hmm. walking you through an abbreviated, but still that same process that I did. Here's how I came to decide that this was a good deal. Yeah. Here's what I'm looking at and get you there. Mm -hmm. And, and I've created like, and I'd be totally cool with, you know, just a ugly, I wouldn't be cool with an ugly spreadsheet, but just a spreadsheet (laughs) with numbers, like no, I don't need any charts or graphs or whatever is green lights, red lights, but I found that that's helpful for you. Yep. And, and I have a hunch that's true for a lot of, spouses because spouses. Yeah. Um, it's just the people who are interested in investing tend to be a little bit more analytical mm. has been my observation sure so that would be my hack if you've got someone who you're married with and if your spouse isn't on board I, I don't care dude. don't do it like yeah. I don't care how great of a deal it is just don't do it yeah. it's not worth the stress on the marriage even if it's I think about like our apartment deal mm. you know had you come back and said no, I feel really uncomfortable. It's 11 units. It's scary. Mm-hmm. I would have worked harder on you. Um, I probably wouldn't have given up, but I would have waited until you yeah. said yes. Yeah. I think at the time you were like, you could tell how brain dead obvious it was a good deal. Yep. Um, but yeah. yeah, and I think we've definitely had that. And it's been a little bit harder now that you've got a full-time job somewhere else. Yeah, I've kind of stepped out and, of that a little bit. And I'm bit doing and... it. Like I find I really have to like reinsert mm-hmm. you into the process like yeah. more intentionally. Yeah. So anyways, that's number six. Um, <laughs> Number seven, uh, 99% of my problems come from inherited tenants. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, number one, they wouldn't actually pass my screening criteria yep. had I brought them in. But then B, it's just really, really, really hard to reset expectations after yes. they've lived there for a while. And like, and my example is like, even just getting some of those tenants to pay online has mm-hmm. been crazy tricky. Yeah. And it's like, I've got some, okay, I've got one tenant who, this is our fault, we put a Dropbox in the lobby of the apartment building. <laughs> and she still pays that way. And I'm like, ah, fine, whatever. Yeah. Um, that's our fault. Uh, but um, the only other people who pay like via check mm-hmm. are people who I've inherited. Yeah. I was like, all right, whatever. It's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fine. Well, people um, don't but like that's to just change. Like, but it's, yeah, and so that, that idea of, that's where most of my problems come from. Now, so the hack isn't kick everybody out. Right. It, it's just like, you just got to understand that it's going to be different. Yeah. You can set enforceable limits if you wanted to. I will only accept rent if paid online. Mm-hmm. And if you send me a paper check, I will send it back to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that's an option. Um, I have not exercised that option. I've decided not to enforce that one. Well, but it would cause some turnover, which that would also this, solve your problem. This for a recent but. one. So I had a tenant. He mails <clears> me <throat> a um, a money order every single month. Mm-hmm. Didn't come in. He sent it right before the ice storm hit, uh, and I never got it. Weird. Yeah, and he was like, "Oh, I got the receipt of buying it." I'm like, "Awesome." Huh. I did not receive it. Not here. And so thankfully we've got a pretty good rapport, so it's fine. And we're just going to wait until the time expires and then get he'll just, one. he'll get a refund and resend it to me. We got to wait until March to do it. Um, but huh. yeah, but one of those, like if you pay it online, 
this yeah. wouldn't be an issue. Uh, so, anyways. Yeah. It's, like, uh, it's all good. But yeah, those are where my, that's where most of my problems come from. Hmm. And so it's just recognizing that that's the case. Yeah. And if a turnover happens, especially an existing tenant, like, cool. I know it's a lot of work because you probably got to do work on the unit, but um, yeah. it's all good. You get to reset and establish your standards and yeah. enforceable statements yeah, yeah. from the get-go. All right. Number eight. I would say if you have more than four units and maybe even like, or more than two properties, I would say you want to use some sort of accounting software that <laughs> automatically integrates the tenant payments and pulls in bank transactions. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can absolutely do it all in Excel. And I did it up until 16 units. Yeah. Then I finally went, all right, this is this a is lot a of lot. work. <laughs> and then we did some software that allowed you to take payments, but mm -hmm. didn't integrate with any sort of accounting system. Mm -hmm. And that was lame because yeah. then you still had to track all the yeah. transactions. And then we did Reconcile one. everything. Yeah. And then we did one that um, it did the opposite. It, it pulled everything in, but mm -hmm. then didn't integrate with, didn't pull in a checking account stuff. And it was still, because uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. there was like, like these two separate things. And yeah. so um, there's a lot of options that are out there. Um, for example, I know that if you pay for QuickBooks, there's this, like a portal plugin. So you can send your customers a portal so they can see all their payments mm. and make payments from there. Super nice. That is cool. Um, yeah. Or we use door loop is ours. Um, there's a whole bunch of others, but I like it cause it's all integrated. Yeah. Door loop is technically geared towards property managers. Mm. So there's a few things I've had to do in there to kind of trick mm. the system. Yeah. Like for example, I have a, a fake property mm. that is my general business stuff. Cause there's just certain things like, for example, our vehicle, I charge that to the entire company. Then at the end of the year, we apportion it out to the properties. Okay. Yeah. So, but I have a fake property sure. that captures all of those things. Because that's how it expenses. is all tracked. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So there's things I got to do to make it work, but having it all integrated yeah. is really, really nice. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. <laughs> um, that's my hack. Pay for it. It's worth it. All right. Number nine, which I think kind of relates to rule number one from last week is the 1% rule it's hard to find. And that is that the net, the, the monthly rent should be 1% of the purchase price. Mm -hmm. So if you buy a building for a hundred thousand dollars, you want to rent for at least a thousand. Mm -hmm. So the 1% rule is hard to find, but those deals tend to generate fantastic ROIs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have some examples. Um, oh, they also tend to be lower class properties like the yeah. C class. So they yeah. require more work. Um, but targeting those types of properties has massively, and I did not spell that right at all, accelerated our wealth. It wrote exacerbated our wealth. <laughs> <laughs> um, accelerated our wealth. So, all right, you ready for some numbers on this? Just to sure. have your mind blown here. Mm -hmm. All right, so we earn on average a 30% return per year, okay? And that's without selling our assets, mm. okay? Which is a fantastic return. So the stock market, on average, throughout time, earns you somewhere between seven and 10%. Some mm -hmm. might even argue 15, but let's say seven to 10%. And so let's say 10%. So what that means is you can safely withdraw 4% mm -hmm. from it and not lose, relatively speaking, lose your assets to inflation, mm -hmm. right? Because if you take it all 10%, now yeah. you're having to sell your assets essentially yeah. to do it. So that's not good. So if you do 4%, inflation will keep you going. Mm -hmm. You essentially keep your assets the same. So all I'm trying to say is, our 30% is equivalent to a 4% withdrawal from the stock market because in both cases, you don't have to sell your assets. And because if we sold our properties, our ROI would be like through the roof. Okay, so here's what this means. Mm -hmm. You would need to invest seven and a half times as much money Oof. into the stock market to earn what we get. Which is a way to do it, but that sounds really hard. <laughs> yeah, and, and so again, this is kind of related to this like the 1% rule. That's a, that's a heuristic mm. that we've used. Yeah. Um, it kind of reflects like an 8% cap rate mm. if you're in the, the commercial world. And yeah, my experience has just been like, the cash flow is really nice. Mm -hmm. The properties tend to make a lot. And as a result, you don't have to invest and save as much, yeah. which is pretty convenient. And yeah, honestly, that's I how I was able to quit my job so fast. Initially, when we were first investing, I relied on that one a lot. Cause I, yeah. I wasn't as confident with num with the numbers and like thinking through all the implications of things. I was just like, okay, what's a quick way that I can think about this. And that, yeah. that was what I relied on. And 
it made sense to me. So yeah, and, and most I, of those yeah. properties were profitable day one. Yeah, so I was like, good. <laughs> and and so I usually get the pushback. Well, then there's nothing to buy in Corvallis. I go, yeah, I know, which is why we never bought a place in Corvallis. Yeah. until <laughs> last year, when guess what? It turned out it was a one percent deal. Yeah, it wasn't what I was specifically going for, but it turned out in retrospect that's what it was. Yeah, and yeah, so we make money off of it, mm-hmm. and it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I think that means like there's a bunch of markets where you wouldn't buy, mm-hmm. and like yeah, exactly. Yep. And so I don't explicitly look for that anymore, but sure. my observation has been, as a general rule, the deals that I like that work out also match this one percent rule. Hmm. So that's just kind of a back of the envelope mm-hmm. kind of thing that I've discovered. Yep. All right. Number 10. This is it. Woo-hoo. Number 10 for episode 10. Treat it like a business. You don't need to form an LLC, but you probably should have a separate checking account and a separate email and phone and address don't hurt either. But most importantly, you want to act professionally. And you do want to schedule regular times during the week to work on it. And I get it. If you only got one rental, it's not that much time. Mm-hmm. But it is at the very least. Let's look at the bookkeeping. Let's review some laws. Mm-hmm. Let's review what's going on with the market. Like there's these things that you should do and you should treat it as such, not just this hands off, I don't mm-hmm. touch it. I would even argue if you are a passive investor in a syndication, mm-hmm. you may not need to set time set aside, well, set time aside mm-hmm. weekly, but at least monthly and definitely quarterly. Like yeah. when a report comes in, read it, try to understand mm-hmm. it, follow up with it. I think that that's important to mm-hmm. do. Um, just to, and act professionally towards your tenants, mm-hmm. all that stuff. I mean, I will, depend on where we're at and who I'm talking to in the situation, I'll lean into the like, no, I'm a professional, treat me mm. as a professional, here's how we're doing. Or I'll lean into the like, oh, I'm just a local landlord, <laughs> making it work, kind of depends on the situation. Mm-hmm. And obviously I don't, I don't own this, so I don't like go around, you know, like a brand new Series 7 BMW <laughs> or a totally tricked out Model S Tesla. Yeah. Like I don't do that. Just I'll, I'll drive that up car. to your... <laughs> but, you know, but like when I say I'm going to call someone, I do. Yeah. I arrive on time to appointments. If for whatever reason something comes up and I'm not going to make it on time, I mm. let them know. Like, do the professional stuff. Yeah. Treat it like a professional business. And mm. I think that, um, which again is part of the whole mm. respect thing. Yep. We talked about last week. Respect um, and communicate. I think is important. That's I'll what I got, man. To that. Those are my. Awesome. Those are my ten hacks. And um, hacks. Yeah, I think. If you do those. Uh, I have a good hack. Yeah, let me hear it. Don't refinish cabinets. Oh, Just dude. buy new ones. <laughs> Just buy. Hack. Yeah, I've got the, Mic I got drop. the scar from doing that one. <laughs> yeah. It's awful. Oh, yeah. Especially when you have to do it on and your maybe own. maybe not. Because okay. your husband is on the couch on pain meds. <laughs> Injuring himself. Because he hurt himself like in the and, first few and, okay. hours of starting the project. Here's a, there's a disclaimer. Maybe it's okay to refinish like newer cabinets, but if they have like 12 layers of paint on them, no. Yeah, just, it's not just. Starter. You're done. Take those to the dump. <laughs> that actually, that would have been a huge project <gasps> to take the cabinets out and install new ones. Because then you would have had to redo drywall and like it. It and, would have been easier than the countertop stripping off all that paint. I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Or just hire help. I guess that's the other. Buy property that has enough profit. <laughs> save for it so that when the time comes, you don't have to do it yourself. <laughs> I, uh, I will I say know. we did learn a lot. From doing we things did. ourselves initially. Yeah, so, yeah. We got pretty good. Worth it. Uh, doing cabinets, replacing windows, redoing flooring. This could painting. be another, you know, future lesson. Okay. Um, don't use broken tools because you hurt yourself. Oh, <laughs> That's right. That was the same project. So, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. It just, just popped in my head. Oh, uh, right tool makes the job much easier. That's, That's for certain. That is Which good. I think in some ways is That's what I was talking hack. about, like with the accounting stuff. I sure. just don't think we were using the right tool and it made life hard. Mm-hmm. But I think initially, like Excel is a totally fine tool, but eventually, like, nah, it's not the right one anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Those are my 10 hacks. Hopefully you it. found those valuable. And if you enjoyed this podcast, we would appreciate it if you left just a quick rating wherever it is that you listen to your podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.